Mais merci. Euh, sur un autre sujet. Thank you. On another topic, Ottawa still hasn't signed the agreement on social housing with Quebec. From the point of view of uh, CMHC, do you believe that that could be done uh, in a short, uh, in a near future? Thank you. It would be our hope that we could do so in the near future. We have been engaged in negotiations with each province for, as you would know, a long, a long period of time. Um, with the province of Quebec, uh, we have sent them a number of draft agreements. Um, and in fact, there's a number of, uh, of projects that, um, that are held up on announcement pending that agreement. Our people stand ready to finish an agreement. Um, we're working earnestly with our colleagues at uh, La Société, Société... We're working with our um, colleagues at the Société d'Habitation du Québec. So I understand that CMHC is ready to move forward, uh, including with uh, with Quebec's way of doing things and not with the same conditions that are required for other provinces? Agreed to um, a, uh, I'll use the word distinct, it's not distinct, um, uh, an asymmetric agreement with the province of Quebec, and that is indeed what we proposed. Um, they have asked for conditions that are outside of my authority to negotiate, um, and, uh, and we've informed them of that, and uh, hopefully we can reach an agreement very soon. You still have a minute, Gabriel. Oui. Merci, Monsieur le, le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, my questions have to do with the um, yeah, the uh, emergency aid to commercial uh, leasing property. That's that assistance is targeted for small businesses administrated the same way as the um, um, land, uh, the building owner have a um, mortgage or not. Could you um, give us uh, details on that new information and how it will be managed? In the same way. And so what we will do is we, we um, a landlord has to get an attestation from his or her tenant, from its tenant, that the tenant is in need and affected by COVID-19. Um, that tenant has to pay 25% of the rent. The landlord contributes 25%, and we contribute the balance, uh, 50%, to the landlord uh, in coordination with the local province who will co-fund it. Um, and we do that in agreement with the landlord. And in return, the landlord must agree not to evict and do a few other things. But we will fund that, um, that bridge effectively for three months. Okay, uh, thank you uh, both again. I might uh, mention Ms. Bowers if you want in at some time. I can see it, so just raise your hand and I'm we'll gonna let throw you this in. to her at some point, but uh, <laughs> okay. thank you. Not a problem. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Julian, uh, followed by Mr. Uh, Cumming. Uh, Peter? Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Mr. Sedell. Thanks, Ms. Bowers, for being here today. And we, we certainly hope that your families are safe and uh, healthy. Uh, I have two questions to start. Uh, around the IMPP, uh, economist David McDonald estimated that uh, in the previous financial crisis uh, around 2009, that the IMPP provided $69 billion of support. Yep to Canada's largest banks. Now, at the time, uh, the profits coming out of uh, those same banks was about $27 billion. And famously, Edmund Clark of the TD Bank uh, gave himself a $4 billion bonus and was paid uh, $15 million. Uh, so the, the issue that comes up, of course, in my hometown in Westminster Burnaby, where people are struggling to, to find affordable housing, and they see the near zero interest rate of the Bank of Canada. Uh, they see as well uh, that uh, it, when it comes to deferrals, that they often come with uh, uh, penalties, uh, interest uh, fees. Uh, and so the two questions I have, first off, is what is the amount assumed so far on the IMPP? And then have you insisted uh, in, in this program that banks uh, lower their interest rates. We see credit unions going down to zero, uh, but the, the banks actually give people a break, but they eliminate the fees and penalties, uh, and that they don't engage in what is speculative uh, with this public support, which includes uh, payment of dividends and uh, stock buybacks. Have there, have there been any 
insistences through this program uh, that, that banks uh, not engage in those kind of practices. The insured mortgage purchase program um, that we have initiated um, doesn't include those specific conditions. Uh, it is priced at about one point, as I said, you've got an exhibit in front of you, 1.7 to 1.9%. Um, so far, we have purchased nearly $6 billion, $5.8 billion in mortgages, so not a huge amount. And that's because there's a prolifer proliferation of other uh, funding sources available to banks, including the Bank of Canada, which funds them at about 63 basis points, 0.63%. It's a cheaper form of money, although it's shorter term. Um, and, uh, uh, and in addition, many of them are accessing market funding and not using this funding significantly. It's really more of an emergency measure. And in the early days, uh, through the chair, um, there were massive concerns about a real liquidity crunch that did not materialize and we hope won't uh, materialize. Uh, thank you for that. And I'd like to go on to your presentation. I appreciated uh, the issue of uh, household debt as percentage of, of GDP, yeah. uh, though I take a different uh, point of view than Mr. Polyev, uh, given the Conservatives' uh, background in providing a lot of support to the banking sector. A lot of that family debt actually comes from people who can't afford housing, who, who can't afford their medication. They have to, to borrow uh, because uh, they're having to finance uh, their education as well. Uh, these are things that don't happen in, in so many other countries. And as you point out correctly, uh, Canada's family debt levels are really uh, amongst the highest in the industrialized world. So I'm wondering with CMHC, um, putting aside the, the issue of the IMPP, can, has the CMHC evaluated what the impacts would be on the family debt crisis if we were making significant and large-scale investments in affordable housing? Uh, we had an order, order paper question that showed that over the last five years, we've, there's been about 14,000 units of affordable housing built far below what is needed in this country. About a third of Canadians are renters. Uh, we haven't seen an expansion of the co-op sector. Uh, so what would be the impact on those household debt levels if we actually saw CMHC making uh, large-scale investments in affordable housing again, as they did when we used to have a national housing program uh, a few decades back? So we are, as a result of the national housing strategy, and I'm trying to dig up my numbers. Um, one of my colleagues will tell me a page reference. Um, uh, here we go. Um, we are, we've made significant investments in housing supply. As you correctly say, though, the gap of what's needed um, is, is quite significant. And one of, the, one of the ideas behind the National Housing Strategy and our flagship program called the National Housing Co-Investment Fund is to recruit fund, co-funding from provinces, territories, municipalities, and private developers to create affordable housing as well. Um, and uh, that that is just it takes a long time, unfortunately, to build houses, and it, and demand pops in an instant. Uh, so that, that's that, that's exact. Those are the measures we're taking thus far. I should add that um, our team at CMHC, and, and and on this, if if I may, I offer Romy an opportunity to comment on some of the things we're doing to make that easier for our clients. While I look up some numbers, go ahead, uh, Ms. Powers. Yes, um, so uh, just to build on Evan's comments, when you look at the, the National Housing Strategy, uh, two of the, uh, the the key programs within the National Housing uh, Strategy is the Co-Investment Fund, the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, and the Rental uh, Housing uh, Construction Initiative. And these two programs are intended to support the creation of supply, but as Evan mentioned, um, it, it, it does take time uh, to create the supply. We're, uh, we're in the three-year mark of, uh, of the national housing strategy, or nearing the three-year mark, and we're making progress in terms of meeting our targets, and we're on track. Um, in combination, these two programs will, le will lead to uh, the increase in the housing supply, uh, I mean, affordable housing supply of uh, in excess of 125,000 units, but that's over a 10-year period. And uh, one of the things that's really important for CMHC, we're working, uh, we have teams in place across all regions of Canada, working with uh, for-profit and non-profit housing providers to support 
uh, the creation of housing supply. But we recognize that uh, these programs alone are not enough, and we need to bring more partners to the table. So we have people on the ground working with municipalities, working with the private sector to investigate any other opportunities there are uh, to support uh, the creation of the housing supply. Under those two programs, sorry if I may, the Rental Construction yep. Financing Initiative, we have um, funded, we've committed $6 billion in loans since the program started in April 2017. And since the co-investment fund launched in April 2018, we have committed uh, 500 and, oh, there's some number here, 561, even more, uh, 851 million in repairs, uh, 381 million in grants and 545 million dollars in grants for uh, repairs as well. I, I mixed up some numbers there, but yeah. And I would I would also know we'll get that to those, we'll get to those data. Sorry, mom. Yeah, in in terms of those programs, we recognize that uh, there are very many different types of affordable housing, and the RCFI program is aimed more towards uh, sort of market housing, but at the lower end of market. While the National Housing Co Investment Fund is aimed more towards creating housing for the most vulnerable elements of our society. So, as Canada's National Housing Agency, we're trying to address needs of uh, of uh, different uh, types of Canadians, and we feel that we've been quite successful to date, but there's a lot of work left to do. The headline number okay. to give you is $18 billion spent since the launch of the National Housing Strategy through CMHC on housing in Canada. $18 billion spent 18 since billion. the launch of the National Housing Strategy. Okay. Some of that, some of that is loans. Okay. Uh, thank you. And you'll have another round coming a little later, uh, Peter. Uh, turning to Mr. Cumming and on to uh, Ms. Zerowitz uh, after James. James? Great. Well, thank you for appearing today. Uh, can you tell me why, what was the rationale in uh, having uh, CMHC deliver the CEQA program rather than the banks, given that uh, uh, the CEBA program was being administered by the banks? The, it, it was, um, <laughs> that's a good question that I'm not sure I can unpack quickly enough. Um, the, the short answer is um, the CEBA program, I believe, flows through BDC or EDC, forgive me. Uh, we did talk to, um, I said, industry, science, and economic development, I think it's called, the old industry department, about that as an yep. option. It was it was easier to operationalize and more efficient to do through CMHC. That's the short answer to your question. Um, and it, that, that, that's the answer. So with the program, have you been set with uh, measurables, deliverables, KPIs? Like, how are we going to measure the success of this program and the execution of the program? Uh, we... We will, I don't think we have specific KPIs. Uh, we CMHC, however, um, are uh, administering the program in a way to try and um, max, uh, minimize the amount of uh, evictions. Now, unfortunately, there are some businesses that that uh, are going to struggle and that for whom this won't be sufficient support. Indeed, some of them may have been in trouble going in. So it's a hard egg to unscramble. So have you had to change your staffing contingent? Like what, what, how are you going to execute, execute this new program? Is it with existing staff or how is it going to be executed? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, because we're devoted to housing, of course. And as a matter of strategy, this is a, in a crisis, it's all hands on deck. You help where you can. But we've designed it in a way to minimize disruption to our operations. And we've actually outsourced most of this activity to a third-party provider. Who's and so we're providing oversight. Who's the third-party provider? I'm a, I'm not sure we've released that publicly, and so I'm not sure I can share that with you right now. It was done through a procurement process, as you would imagine. Details are emerging um, on uh, the 25th of this month. Uh, we will get you that answer separately, though. Okay, if you could follow up with details on that, of course. And then, because this is a uh, because rent the rent abatement goes, it's backdated. So, what kind of process have you got in place to make sure that those funds flow back to the uh, tenants? There has to be an agreement that we have to see that the money flows to the tenants. 